thanks for having me today. Uh, I wanted to share with you some of the work um, that we're doing in my group on the removal of carbon dioxide from the atmosphere, but I also want to get us started on kind of um, a larger picture and understanding a broader perspective of carbon removal. Uh, so what this plot is showing is on the y-axis our annual emissions of CO2, and then what you also are seeing is the trajectory, which is called business as usual with the yellow line, and then another trajectory, which is what we're going to have to do in order to prevent two degrees C warming uh, by the end of the century, by 2100. And a lot of the climate models now are indicating that avoiding carbon emissions is no longer enough for meeting climate goals, that we're also going to have to do deep decarbonization and um, removal of CO2 from the accumulated stock in the atmosphere. I was part of a study that was released from uh, the National Academy of Sciences in 2019. And what we were charged as a committee with doing is looking at negative emissions, but also establishing a research agenda for this space. And so in order to meet climate goals, one of the major conclusions from our study is that we're going to have to remove 10 gigatons of CO2 per year, all the way up to mid-century. And then after mid-century, roughly 20 gigatons of CO2 per year, all the way to the end of the century in order to meet climate goals. And so I wanted to give you a little bit of an overview of the different approaches. And so what this table is showing are all of a list of all of the different approaches to carbon removal. And I'm gonna go through these uh, individually just briefly. And then what it's also showing is the estimated costs of doing this today. And then, it, and then finally, uh, towards the right, you can see the scale of being able to do this today for costs of less than or equal to $100 per ton of CO2. And so we have both US and global numbers. And so what you can see here is the first one is called coastal blue carbon, um, where we're looking at um, you know, fisheries and mangroves and seagrass and trying to use these, um, these kinds of uh, biological approaches to uptake of CO2 and trying to enhance them today. Afforestation, reforestation, so uh, growing trees, um, where there weren't trees originally, or also just reforesting, uh, and then forest management, agricultural soils, or advanced farming practices. And I'll talk a little bit more about each of these approaches in the next slide, but here I just want to give you an idea of the scales. Um, and then there's also BACS, which is bioenergy, coupled to carbon capture and storage, uh, direct air capture. My background is in chemical engineering, so I look at a lot of things in the space of BACS, but also direct air capture and mineralization of CO2. And so what we're showing here is that in order to achieve globally roughly 10 gigatons of CO2 removal per year, um, that all of the approaches to doing this are really the nature-based approaches today that are less than $100 per ton. And then the important consideration too is to recognize that we're looking at these um, in terms of waste biomass. So not growing biomass specifically as an energy crop, but actually collecting waste biomass for bioenergy and CCS. Also, it's important to note that direct air capture and carbon mineralization are not included in this estimate um, up to mid-century. And the reason why is because today, uh, those technologies are still pretty early stage and they're more than $100 per ton. And so we're looking here at all of the approaches that are pretty cost-effective today and something that we know how to do actively. And so in this next slide, um, what I'm showing are really just all those approaches that I listed. So you see coastal blue carbon, um, the accelerated chemical weathering of rocks. And so the Earth's crust has a lot of minerals that are rich in calcium and magnesium. Uh, and those minerals are reactive with CO2. And so by finding ways to accelerate the reactivity of those minerals with CO2, that's some of the work that I'm gonna talk to you a little bit more later in my presentation today. Uh, but then another one is thinking about actual chemicals and chemicals to uh, react with CO2 and, and a kind of um, manufactured approach like you see here where you have fans that are actually drawing the air through and overcoming the pressure drop in the, in the air contactor. Um, biomass energy with carbon capture can be thought of a lot of ways, but again, uh, the estimate that we had in the previous slide from the Academy of Science which is really based upon biomass waste. So not growing crops simply to uh, do this, but rather collecting waste. Um, Aforestation, reforestation, or improved forest uh, management approaches is obviously another. Um, and then finally, 
you know, soil carbon storage and different examples of this approach could be um, low tillage or zero tillage of agricultural soils to, to help keep the carbon in the soil. But then there's also other approaches that have a lot of co-benefits. So using biochar, for instance, so that's in the case where we take biomass waste and we gasify it, um, which changes the pore structure of the biomass, makes it tighter, makes it more carbon dense and more difficult to break down and oxidize. And it turns out when you put those types of materials in the soil, it not only can help retain the, the carbon in the soil, but it can also sometimes have co-benefits um, associated with enrichment of the soil, improving um, crop health, and then also um, has another effect of potentially reducing the N2O emissions, which are often a result of over fertilization. And N2O is an even stronger greenhouse gas um, you know, than CO2. So that could have a significant impact. Finally, if you're looking at approaches to capture CO2 from the atmosphere, you have to think about what to do with it. So the nature-based solution of the carbon storage is inherent, but in the selective capture of CO2 from the atmosphere, it's not. And so we look at the dedicated storage of, um, through, of CO2 through geologic formations, like minerals like basalt deep in the earth, um, or even sedimentary basin storage. And so now I'm going to go uh, and take a little bit of a deep dive into direct air capture and tell you a little bit about um, my research in this in this space. Uh, so what is direct air capture? Uh, so so again, actually the atmospheric concentration this is on the slide is about 410 parts per million. So you can see it's probably five or six years old. Um, but capturing CO2 from the atmosphere is difficult because there's just a lot less CO2 in the atmosphere than there is, say, coming out of a stack of a power plant, which is what you see below. And so you can use chemicals to take CO2 out of the air or to take it from uh, the exhaust of a power plant. There's pros and cons to direct air capture. Some of the pros are it has the potential to be a negative emissions technology. It's a method for dealing with those uh, difficult to avoid emissions, like the agricultural sector, transportation, and industry. And it does not require arable land. So biofuels are a great solution until you start to actually scale them up significantly. And, uh, and when you do that, you start to compete with, with food um, for land. And so one of the benefits of direct air capture is, is you, can, you don't have to worry about what that land um, is needed for. For instance, you would never compete with arable land to build a direct air capture plant. You do have to recognize it needs to be nearby um, dedicated storage uh, so that you can minimize the transport of the CO2. You also have to recognize that you need low carbon energy to fuel one of these plants. And so that needs to be nearby. So the concept of putting a direct air capture plant anywhere is, is not correct, but it's definitely more flexible than say, finding land to grow food. Cons are the energy inputs are, are very significant. Um, and in the end, the land footprint is also significant. And it should never be seen as a replacement to just avoid the carbon in the first place. This is just a picture of what it looks like to capture CO2 from a power plant. And so this is a, um, a power plant that's in Texas. It's called Petronova. Um, and it was capturing on the order of about 1.4 million tons of CO2 per year. But what did they do with the CO2 from this plant? They used it for enhanced oil recovery because CO2 is, is, is a surfactant, you know? And so what it's, what it's allowing uh, one to do when you inject it in the supercritical phase in the earth is it's miscible with the oil and it allows the oil producers to get more oil out of the ground. But in doing that, they leave the CO2 behind. And so it's a method of sequestering the CO2, but at the same time, getting more fossil fuels out. So it's a controversial topic to say the least. And so what's happened recently is the price of oil has gone down which means this project is not operating. It doesn't mean that the carbon capture is flawed, it just means that this mechanism by storing carbon through EOR is not really effective because it's, it's highly dependent upon the price of oil. And so it goes back to really needing to think about policy and establishing policy where carbon capture is actually coupled to dedicated storage, not just EOR. But what I wanted to show here is that that column is tall and thin. And it's tall and thin, because what you're trying to do is capture as much CO2 out of the exhaust stream as you can. So in chemical engineering, we learn how to design these kinds of absorption units. And so all of the chemicals and everything is in this tall tower. And as you move up 
the column across those horizontal lines, your gas is becoming cleaner and cleaner in, in CO2. And then the saturated solution is in the opposite direction flowing down using pumps. And that, that solvent has chemicals in it that react with the CO2. And so as the taller you make this column, the more CO2 you scrub from the exhaust stream. The issue is though, when you get to the atmosphere, there's just not a lot of driving force because there's not a lot of CO2. And so you have to actually do the work of pushing that gas through. And so in that case, the design looks a lot different. And so this is the contactor to capture the equivalent, say CO2, this, is, this um, system would require 10 of these units, 200 meters across, just to capture 1 million tons of CO2 per year. And the reason is, is because you notice now, you have this huge contactor area, and it, you kind of, as you go into the, you know, video screen, um, you notice that your bed thickness is shallow. And the reason is, is because you want to minimize the energy required to pu push your gas through. If you were to go deeper, you'd capture more CO2, but you'd also spend more energy and hand power. And so this is an optimized parameter in order to minimize costs. And so the point in showing you this is that it's expensive to do direct air capture, it's difficult, and the systems look very different from point source. And what we're doing in my group is kind of bringing these two concepts together. So we work, work actually uh, with a lot of geologists and we're interested in natural minerals in the earth that readily react with CO2. And rather than building a direct air capture contactor, we're interested in using the earth as the land area um, as the contactor itself. And we're also willing to just use atmospheric velocities like 1.4 meters per second um, for our airflows instead of um, using fans, which just means the process is going to be slower, but it's also a lot cheaper in the end. And so in my work, we do a lot of mapping of where is all of the alkalinity? Where does it exist? And so I, I joke a little bit and say that we need to make a new periodic table to figure out where are all of the waste resources that we can use to react with CO2. And it turns out that a lot of mining opportunities like gold mining and copper, nickel, and even diamonds, um, that the waste material from those, those, those minerals uh, is high in alkalinity and can be reactive with CO2. And so we're interested in all those um, feedstocks and also industrial alkalinity and even asbestos. And so there's a lot of opportunity. And so in our project, this is just a schematic. And this is a, a project that we're setting up at the Penovation site at UPenn. Um, we actually have like two and a half tons of different mine tailing rocks. And we're making about 20 different beds and, and looking at the reaction of CO2 with these different feedstocks and just understanding the opportunity associated with each of these minerals to be able to more naturally um, make this reaction happen. And in the end, a lot of the equipment is associated with the same equipment that one would use for mining. And as you can imagine, we move forward in the energy transition and displace coal-fired power plants, we're also losing a lot of jobs. And so we're thinking that projects like this could also help to create new jobs that aren't that different from some of those other jobs that are being displaced today. And so finally, I'll end with saying um, as an overarching you know, message is that the new portfolio of meeting climate goals isn't just about avoiding deep or avoiding carbon emissions in the first place, but it's also about carbon removal. And because climate math is hard, we're gonna need all of these things.